Hi guys, Rod from Think Bensonium here, and given I'm recording this video in Easter week, I thought I would move on to the topic of religion and science by making the claim that the subject of science itself cannot avoid the God question. Okay, so I think most people would agree that the scientific method has been one of the most powerful intellectual tools we possess, and in general it has led to many improvements in our day-to-day -day living. Yes, it is true we can point to where science has created things that are to our detriment, nuclear warfare for example, but on the whole, our lives, compared with those lived in the Middle Ages, have largely benefited from the scientific method. Many people also assume that science naturally lives within an atheistic paradigm, because no scientific explanation ever references the idea that something outside the scientifically observable universe made it. Similarly, many high-profile scientists who popularise the subject are also very vocal atheists. A few good examples are Lawrence Krauss, Richard Dawkins, David Attenborough, Sam Harris and Brian Cox, to name just a few. Yet the formal idea that science cannot invoke God within its explanatory framework actually has nothing to do with atheism per se, but is in fact an outworking of the very important scientific rule known as Occam's Razor. The creator of this rule, a William of Occam, was an English Franciscan friar and theologian, so certainly could not be described as an atheist. Yet he also is credited with the statement, entities must not be multiplied beyond necessity, which is essentially the essence of the methodology of scientific reductionism. The idea is that in order to make scientific progress, your direction of intellectual travel needs to be such that you are explaining how things operate using more fundamental entities. In other words, your understanding of the universe increases as you are able to classify the complex data set you observe into a more limited number of fundamental organizing principles. Following this logic, introducing entities which are themselves highly complex in order to explain another phenomenon that is less complex gets you nowhere in terms of understanding that phenomenon and that is why such a hypothesis must be rejected as it is breaking the rule of Occam's razor. To give one concrete example, if you were trying to understand friction, you might propose that friction occurs because on every surface there is a myriad of microscopic demons that push against the motion of an object. It is possible to set up a little thought experiment in terms of a conversation where you can show that this little idea can be made to fit well with the experimental data of friction and the dialogue of this conversation is now shown on the screen. If you read this dialogue, you will see our imaginary protagonist of the demon hypothesis for friction is able to explain with his demon idea a large chunk of the experimental data that is the result of what is called friction. Of course, in our silly example, you could disprove Faustus's demon hypothesis by oiling the table, which would drown the demons, and then remove the oil. I guess in this situation, the return of friction might be because the demons have resurrected? Anyway, enough silliness. Even if Faustus's demon explanation for friction could be made to agree with every experimental observation of friction, the problem with the explanation becomes apparent when one simply asks this follow-up question. Why does the cracking of the demon's bones cause a resistance to the object's motion? In other words, trying to explain a natural phenomenon like friction with a more complex entity like a demon has precisely zero explanatory value in any scientific sense and this is why Occam's razor is critical when it comes to evaluating the potential validity of any potential scientific hypothesis which purports to be an explanation of a scientific observation. This also means that God can never be invoked within the scientific paradigm because any explanation involving a deity is the ultimate violation of Occam's razor as you can't get a more complex entity than the deity itself. Therefore, the God hypothesis within the scientific framework has zero explanatory power. The possible idea that gravity bends light because God made it that way is a non-answer in the scientific sense because it gets us nowhere 
even if it were a true answer in the philosophical sense that the universe was created by an outside intelligence. Yet despite the fact that the God explanation must be, for the correct operation of scientific reductionism, excluded from all scientific explanations, this does not mean that the question of God's existence has no bearing on the scientific method. Okay, so given Occam's razor, how exactly does the question of God's existence have an influence on the scientific method, I hear you ask? Well, the answer is to do with the calibration of the scientific method itself in terms of its overall utility at being able to get a true picture of the nature of reality in which we find ourselves. The best way to explain what I mean by this is to place the question of the deity's existence inside the scientific paradigm in the form of two possible hypotheses. If we do that, we arrive at the following possibilities. Hypothesis 1. Atheism. The universe is a time-finite closed system which possesses the property of self-actualization. Human consciousness and personhood are emergent properties of this self-actualizing system, meaning that there is no intrinsic discontinuity between unconscious matter and personhood. And hypothesis 2, theism, the universe is a time-finite open system which operates from the action of an eternal entity that is external to that system. Now at this point the statement is consistent with deism. Furthermore, that entity is conscious and possesses personhood which Ni has succeeded in at least once in reproducing within the universe Ni has created. I have used the modern non-gendered pronoun Ni rather than he or she because I do not want to contaminate the purely scientific hypothesis with any religious framework. Likewise, it should be noted that while I have chosen to state the hypothesis with a single creator, it can just as easily be stated with polytheism as its subject. Yet if there is a creator or creators that possess personhood, then the impersonal pronoun it is also not valid. If we now assume the atheism hypothesis is correct, then at least in principle the scientific method should be able to ultimately resolve human consciousness and the ultimate origin of the universe. Alternatively, if the theism hypothesis is correct, then it means that the scientific method as an instrument to understand reality has an upper limit in that it cannot explain ultimate origins because by definition the ultimate origin of the universe, if God exists, is the result of something which is not observable acting on the observable universe. And secondly, there may very well be a discontinuity between the objects of scientific study, the universe and everything in it, and the entity that is the thing doing the studying, human consciousness. In this situation, it may never actually be possible to answer the question of why a certain configuration of brain neurons results in the personhood of a given human individual. A final question, therefore, which is worth considering before we close this thought, is what would scientific theories look like if we assumed hypothesis 1 was true, atheism, when in fact hypothesis 2, theism, is true. I strongly suspect that the answer is very much what we see in modern physics and biology. While we have very beautiful theories and models which powerfully explain much of the complex data we have observed from the universe in terms of its observable operation, when it comes to origin theories or theories of consciousness, the working hypotheses become much more fanciful and require a very high degree of faith to accept their validity because they are not based on empirical data, and trying to design experiments to test these ideas is pretty much impossible. To take one example, a theory that is very popular with physicists who hold an atheist framework is the multiverse theory, because from their perspective it appears to be a fruitful way to explain cosmic fine-tuning. The idea is essentially quite simple, and I have put a link to Brian Cox's Human Universe episode below, where you can watch how he explains how multiverses can answer the question of how the laws of the universe appear to be so precisely configured to allow us to exist in the first place. The essence of the idea, as Cox explains it, is to use a national lottery analogy. The chances of you winning the national lottery in any given week is very slim, because you need to guess at least six numbers from more than 40. However, 
If you could purchase every possible six number combination that could be drawn that week, then by design you would win the National Lottery because one of the tickets you possess would be the winning ticket. Many physicists now propose that there is some sea of quantum fluctuations which leads to the birth of billions of universes. Some even argue an infinite number, whatever that means, and all have varying cosmological constants. The universe that has the right cosmological constants for us to exist is the one we observe, and so we are amazed at how precise the constants had to be to allow our existence, forgetting that our universe just happened to arise by chance out of the billions of other non-observable universes that coexist with it. In the same way, biologists will also extend the original Darwinian scope of evolution to operate at the level of non-living, non-reproducing molecules telling fantastic stories of pre-RNA worlds where the random jostling of macro-organic molecules coupled to some form of prebiotic natural selection was enough to bring the nanotechnology of life itself into being. Yet this rabbit hole goes even deeper if you start looking at cutting edge fields such as quantum gravity. I have included a second YouTube video which is well worth taking the time to watch just so you get a feel for how far physics has drifted from its original rule set. In the second video, the presenter Mariam Kerr states that physics allows all energy in the universe to convert into a single conscious system, and that given enough time, anything that can happen will happen. She goes on to state that, by this axiom, this system of universal consciousness has already emerged somewhere in the frames of space-time ahead of us. Because it is possible, it is inevitable. In fact, according to the evidence of retrocausality time loops, that inevitable future is co-creating us right now, just as we are co-creating it. Now, I'm not going to make any secret of the fact that when I hear such musings, I am highly skeptical that such ideas could be true. It is somewhat ironic because most atheists accuse theists of being gullible to believe in a God that made the universe. However, for my money, the modern atheist creation stories are just as myth-like as any theistic ones. Similarly, in order to believe them, you really must first fully embrace the atheist hypothesis, so you are left with no other alternative for how a universe, as we observe it, came into being, except via some fantastical mythology involving retrocausality time loops, multiverses, or pre-RNA clay worlds where natural selection operates. This final idea was presented by Richard Dawkins in his book The Blind Watchmaker. When all is said and done, I think these ideas are clear examples of how the belief system of atheism is now distorting mainstream science, resulting in very strange scientific theories in relation to ultimate origin and human consciousness. And yet I hear a loud protest from atheists stating, but isn't theism equally guilty of such a crime? Well yes, historically it very much is. However, we now live in a time where theism has rightly been disentangled from the scientific method by Occam's razor and a commitment to faithfully represent the experimental data we obtain from our study of the universe. The bottom line is that neither theism nor atheism should play a part in influencing how we develop theories and ideas to progress our scientific understanding of the universe. If we assume that the God question is still open, then we must assume that the theistic hypothesis is just as possible as the atheist one. In such a situation, it is reasonable to state that there is a possible boundary to what scientific reductionism can answer, and if one attempts to go beyond that boundary, then the result would be theoretical gobbledygook. Just as the middle-aged theistic gobbledygook hampered science before the Enlightenment, so the new atheist gobbledygook has the same potential to block the progress of scientific inquiry, as research areas are sent on wild goose chases down theoretical rabbit holes, which come about due to a dogmatic insistence that God must not exist. My own personal view is to assume that our scientific paradigm has limits to the ultimate questions it can resolve. Incidentally, such an idea could be true even without a personal deity. Just the fact that there could be an impersonal power that acted to create our universe, but which is distinct from it, should be enough to raise the possibility that the scientific method may not be able to ever fully resolve how our reality came into being using only the data that we can currently obtain from our universe. 
If we adopt a more cautious stance, we might be able to relax our insistence that a successful theory must be able to explain ultimate origin, and in so doing, we may just stumble on a new, simpler system that helps unify the two great theories of general relativity and quantum mechanics, which currently are in conflict with one another at a fundamental level. Okay, so that's my thought for this week. If you like this video, please do hit the like key below. And if you want to see more of my content, then please do hit the subscribe button and the bell notification key if you would like to be notified of when I release new thought videos. So until next time, I hope your body and mind are in a good place and happy Easter. Bye guys.